in your award-winning career as an actress, you've been in many films, Wendy, but never made one of your own. Despite the fear of difficulty, you made Mercy. After a friend's suggestion to write something you aren't as passionate about, you said, rather than, I love this, rather than write something else, Mercy seemed to write me. So please share your personal story about how Mercy came to be and in what way did it write you? Well, I've, hello, by the way, hello, lovely <laughs> to meet you, Ali. <laughs> and thank you for this. Um, I have been an actor, as I said, for 45 years now. And in 2011, I heard of an investigation by Animal Aid that, um, into nine abattoirs in the UK, they investigated, and eight out of the nine were found to be abusing the animals. Um, and one of those was near to where I lived. And I heard of a few people going down there to stand there. And at that time, it wasn't called a vigil, but, but pretty much that's what it was. People would go and bear witness to the animals going into the slaughterhouse and to try and raise awareness of what was going on because above and beyond the cruelty anyway that's in an abattoir in a slaughterhouse because the animals are going there to be killed so how carefully they might be treated or not it's it's a numbers game of they have to kill those animals that's their job but on top of that w were these abuses but so I found out about these abuses, but then it also led me to find out globally how awful it is for an animal in the animal agriculture industry. Not only its death, but its life mm -hmm. is not great at all. And um, so above, so even underneath the abuses that were taking place that, across these eight abattoirs in 2011, because there was no uh, independently monitored CCTV. There is CCTV now in the UK, not in Wales, but if it's independently monitored or not, I'm not sure. I think anyone would have to check, but I think there is there, but it, need, it I, I think all I know, it, it needs to be independently monitored. Otherwise, how do you know? Right. Anyway, I, I stood there and saw these creatures go in and it had always been in the periphery of my mind being on and off vegetarian about how an animal's life is and what it would be like but I'd never witnessed it for myself in these trucks not as big as in America two stories high perhaps three but not quite as big as in any other parts of the world but still and an enormous scale of animals between three and nine months old probably and so standing there and when the trucks would stop momentarily or, more, or longer, depending on if anyone stood there, they, there was no arrangement then for people to, for the, you know, it wasn't new, it was new. Everyone mm -hmm. was just starting out. I don't know about here, uh, there, but I'd only just found out about it anyhow. Anyway, so I, I began to make the connection. It's... <laughs> It's really emotional to 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 uh, recall, and and that's what I didn't want to write about because I knew it would be emotional to, to recall. But like we would see a dog as an individual, say for example, um, there was this pig or many pigs, all individuals, or, or it could be any animal, chickens, um, cows, sheep. It doesn't really matter which animal it is. Happened to be a pig, pigs. So that's why I say it's kind of allegorical because it, I think it represents, I hope it represents all animals and all the people in it represent all kinds of people anyway. So I filmed one of the pigs, which you see in the film, which my character actually does say goodbye to that becomes mercy, that is mercy, that Maria Austin fades in and out of, if you see what I mean. We see the animal and the, the human, the being, Mm -hmm. what we would might connect with so so I made the connection which I didn't even know it was a term until I saw earthlings <laughs> and um it was so tragic a thing to see another being in a truck crammed full of others moments before it was to die with with scars over it where it had probably been beaten or been bitten and the the fear in its eyes and the and the moment of 
like you're looking at me now, so innocent, so pure, so so with love, so hello kind of thing, you know, just not knowing what was its fate. But And then this kind of thing of this animal, this being, being smelling the air probably for the first and certainly for the last time. So there was a kind of hope as well there, like and a curiosity, a constant forgiving of whatever had happened before to come to a human and go, what are you? Who are you? What is this? But fear then. And the, and so hearing them go in and hearing that happen. And, and so this over and over again, because we stood there as this trial went to court and eventually the two guys were sent to prison for a while and almost pity in a way, ultimately for them, that they were caught up in this system. So I, I went away from this year, perhaps, of this court case going through. And after that subsided, it didn't subside in me. The screams remained, the visions remained. And I was, it was like a living PTSD nightmare of this. And I just couldn't rest. I felt I had to do something. I didn't know what to do. Um, I know there are activists who do do things so amazingly about this subject, but I didn't know what I could do. And all I knew was my art form, my acting. And I'd been in films and I knew about film a little, but not how to make it. So anyway, I just started writing really to process it and it became a play. And then I had some friends read it. And I would read it out loud as I was going. And it was very raw and very angry. Then. And it's like, you know, the characters were much more extreme, I guess. In, and the story was in a way. And then a group of my act, of actor friends read it. And it was over two and a half hours long. And they were like, oh, at the end. And it was like, ah, like raw pain. And they, you know, and they gave me their feedback. And their feedback was very honest and very good. And I took a year then to receive that because it was kind of, I'd never really written a long piece before. So it was quite a trauma to receive kind of critique. And then I thought, ah, oh, that will be that. I don't need to do it again. I've done it now, but it, it came up again and again in me, unfinished business. Mm. So I had to sit and process and eventually I got another draft. Sorry, this is such a long winded answer, no. but I got another draft. <laughs> and then I, I got a lot of those same actors not to re read it out loud but to read it for me and they said that's it you're not you're not doing any of the things that you did before you're not preaching you're not you it's not too out there it's not too this it's not too that it's okay it's kind of that's got something there so then I created um I thought I'd try it as a one woman piece, you know, and I don't know. So I kind of got set, I got music, I got costume, and I did it at the wonderful railway pub, the Ra which is no more at the moment, but had to close down during lockdown. But um, this wonderful, the railway inn in South End, we did a, we did a performance there. And I was the abattoir worker let, with a balaclava, letting everyone in one by one. I was trying to disorient people and this really weird music as they came in. And it was stupid of me. I didn't allow them to eat a drink. And I thought I should have done because they could have had a much more fun time. But uh, they were they were deprived of um, alcohol for, anyway, because you could see things with drinking a little glass of wine sometimes. And it's quite a nice experience. But that wasn't permitted to them so they sat there and it was it was an hour long and I got a good response back I, it was a reading but I performed reading with lights and sound and I was whew, at the end of it and um, they said take it to Edinburgh so I tried to get into the Edinburgh festival but I was just too late and my friend Maria Austin who now plays Mercy said why don't you make it into a film and I went hmm so I set around rewriting it into a kind of screenplay and saw it visually rather than play. And that, and it just has been going on and on and it's like I couldn't stop a momentum. And every time it got difficult, I thought, think of the animals. Mm. Well, they're, they're a bit, they're a, it's a bit more difficult for them, Wendy, than you being sitting there going, oh, isn't this difficult? 
you know, stop it, just carry on. So here we are, <laughs> and I haven't stopped. Uh, well, so, it, yeah. What, what an incredible, incredible beginning to this, this story. Um, you know, so honestly, as bold as it is brilliant, the artistry delivered both visually and verbally humanize in this instance pigs in a way that I have never seen or heard before to create the parallel that you did between their reality and our own is unprecedented. I was feeling things I wasn't expect. I was understanding things in a way that I hadn't before. How did your idea to craft this story in this way with this overlay of empathy how did that come to you? Well, A, thank you for your beautiful uh, comments. I, I am very grateful for those. Um, I, my ego is like, oh, yeah. But my reality is, <laughs> um, I don't know. It just seemed to come and... I have been lucky in my life to work with such brilliant people like Sir Peter Hall, who founded the Royal Shakespeare Company, who taught me all about Shakespeare and the form of Shakespeare, which is the language, the heightened language and why that's used, and also the form of mask, where in Greek drama they use masks to tell their stories through with actors wearing masks and um and the mask became a kind of term to use for how you mediate such extraordinary like they talked of terrible things in greek drama and greek tragedy and as they do in all kinds of drama of course but um very high high dramas and in order for an actor to be able to bear telling such a story, the mask was a kind of conduit, a, a, a medium through which this high drama could travel mm. without the actor combusting and the audience going, ah, that's too ugly for me to. So I, I thought of that in, 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 in allowing this process, really, it was not really um, intellectual. Although in some, there's a tiny part of it that kind of was in that. I thought of those people and that and of, of Peter Hall, Peter Hall, and how how he would teach me these things, and and all the other directors I've worked with, and and the way that they've crafted film that I've been in, not not um, you know, and TV, but it's still film, so mm. not having done it so mm -hmm. I had the vision and I'd had the experience in a way mm -hmm. and I wanted to find a way to allow those screams that I heard to be sent across without it being literally a scream because after an and a half hours you'd go okay I get it it's pretty bad in there but I, I wanted to take people on a journey and to allow them to come into the journey. And I thought of the mask and maybe language, so heightened language for, for allowing that to happen. And how could I give the pigs voice? Because my company that I've kind of made is called Hear Their Voices. It was for the voiceless until someone said to me years and years ago, because I had a MySpace, that's how old I am, <laughs> years and years ago. <laughs> It was called Full of Voiceless. And they said, but animals have voices. We just don't hear them. We don't, we can't listen or we don't listen. Not all of us, of course, but, you know, those cries we don't hear. So it became hear their voices. So how could I get people to hear those voices without being repelled? There's a certain parts in the film, there are certain parts in the film that are, not great on the air. I don't know if you want to talk for a while because I have a aircraft going over so it might blot out the sound for a moment. <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> I'll just put me on mute. I'll put me on mute if you want and you can maybe ask me something else. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, no, we can give it a moment to pass over. Um, <clears throat> 
Yeah, uh, you know, so so let's switch gears to a moment. I'll get I'll get a little personal here. Um, you've been very gracious in sharing um, uh, your personal things about this. My personal thing about this is, for me, instant regret for past pleasure found in bacon wrapped anything and everything paired with the remorse that I had for the enjoyment of family dinners that featured pineapple topped ham. This was my immediate response to mercy, this instant regret. And while I am no longer uh, one who eats meat, having given up my carnivorous ways, um, I still felt regret. And not only, this is interesting, not only for the pigs, but for the people who essentially did my dirty work in the slaughterhouse. And that is a sentiment that your character in the film shares. So um, I'd like for you to tell us about why you felt it was important for the empathetic lens of this film to not only be focused on the pigs, but also on the people. Thank you. And I share your guilt and apologize in, in retrospect for causing you any more you know that's not the intention but I apologize for that feeling if that's what happened to you because it's a horrible feeling to have mm -hmm. certainly one I've carried um, why why I wish I could altogether claim that that was my initial desire to do that but at first I was very shallow in my thinking when I first heard about all this and saw all this and was like I was angry at slaughter men and you know what I mean as a mm -hmm. as a job and or slaughter people I don't know I've not met a, a female yet that has slaughtered but I guess there must be but I'm so over time as oh, that's why I kind of wrote me because as soon as I started writing Slaughter Man, in the first drafts, it was not a sympathetic character, but it became so, I hope. And when I reflected on the actual people that I'd seen in court that day, or the, that I've met outside slaughterhouses, I wished I could say that they were horrible people, but I can't, they're people. They have wives and families and feelings and pets, probably. And I remember seeing one at one slaughterhouse sleeping on the pavement, like, I don't know where, where they'd come, what country they'd come from to get this job. But I don't think that it was a job that necessarily they wanted. And I don't think they were having the best time to have to sleep outside the slaughterhouse on the pavement so exhausted and maybe couldn't get home or I don't know who knows but the PTSD I read about in in people and and then I so I started reading more and learning more about you know maybe poor farmers or people that couldn't have another kind of job and that was their livelihood and so that whoa this problem is so massive it's not as simple as they're bad we're good you know if only right. it was that way then you could put everyone in a pigeonhole and be done with it but not at all so it so it wrote me in that when I started writing Slaughter Man for instance the main uh, the older one played my Mark Winget he became he was quite angry and but then I I saw underneath and I, I wanted to give him maybe some reasons why the stress of working in an environment like that, having to do that, maybe not having another qualification, who knows? Mm -hmm. And I'm not being, I hope, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I hope I'm not neutral as such, but I hope I can see other sides so that it might draw people in mm -hmm. to not maybe 
just look on it as a one way thing yeah that that these people as much as everybody needs help to transition from this kind of work to another kind of work you know mm -hmm. and and then yeah the so that was the why and then the younger slaughter man you know he's in love he's he's actually shocked by what he's having to do and i heard about the ptsd that's caused in people and i've seen interviews with with people that have done this work and it's the trauma in them and the guilt like day after day having to do that any job is hard day after day isn't it but killing for a job it must really rent your soul and your being your dreams must not be great it must be very hard so kind of sympathy is the word and um profound kind of feelings towards all people that have anything to have to do with this although sometimes you look at what's happening and you think how could you do that that's cruel you know but i think they're I just, so so i i can't go into the psychology because i'm not a psychologist i can only wonder at it all and yeah the guilt at being the consumer because i was for a while in and out of my life so yeah. i share that guilt absolutely Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It took me that long, you know. Yeah. Till I was, yeah. Well, in the... Did that answer your question? No, Sorry. no, no absolutely. Around. Absolutely it did. And, um, I mean, certainly, uh, thank you for apologizing, but no need to apologize. We um, have become a society that's so on demand. This is the news I want. This is the food I want. These are the things that I want. I want, I want, and everyone, everything caters to our wants that when something is in front of us that we don't want to see, a truth that we don't want to know, it's all the more reason that it's so important that we see it and that we hear it and that we are open to it. And what your film does exactly. is a, opens that door. It doesn't like slam it <laughs> or, you know, do this kind of a thing to it. It says, by the way, you know, um, By the way, yeah. and you know, also, also like, sorry to interrupt you, but before I forget, because I know I will remember what you were going to say is that the advertising for, you know, it's happy cow and every, all the animals that you see in the advertising for great beef or I don't know, I don't like to call an animal beef, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever is all happy. Everything's happy, a happy pig and a, a this and a that, you know. But however, even if you do get a bit of happiness during their lives in the, in the, in the, you know, the field, if they're lucky enough to have a field, mm -hmm. great. But still they have to go through that slaughterhouse right. gate, don't right. they? They still have to go there. So yeah, so the advertising for, for us as humans, it's, we're, di we're told, don't look there, it's fine. It's okay, we're brought up that way. That, because if they advertised, like, if the advertising was opposite, oh, this is what happens, hey, look, the bolt goes to the head and the knife to the throat. Oh, yeah. sometimes it might miss. You know, yeah. we would go, okay, thanks for telling me. <laughs> I, right. I perhaps won't do that. Yeah. We're not helped, are we, by the industry? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, it, and so it, so again, why it's it's just so important um, that that films like yours are the ones that that are seen and that are heard. And if we are to evolve in our humanity, then we have to um, be able to be to be open to what is about not us, uh, what is about us, not about me or about you, but about us. And um, you know, when we speak about film and the powerful medium that it is to fuel change. Again, Mercy is an incredible example of this. And um, my, so my question now is, what is the change that you hope to see as a result of your film beyond the awareness that you provide so brilliantly? Um, what actions do you hope to inspire? An action is to do and change um could an action be for each human being that perhaps we look at every human being 
and every creature on the planet, no matter how large or small, as equal to ourselves and equally deserving mm. uh, a long and happy life. I guess, you know, because it's not just towards the animals we are unkind, but to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I don't know if that's change. I mean, ultimately, if we all went plant-based, I think it would be better for everybody, for the world, the planet, the humans, the animals, mm -hmm. for our health. Um, yeah, I think that is the ultimate change to stop eating animals, mm -hmm. stop using animals for our, for our design or our fun or our entertainment. You know, it's hard because that's another thing our culturally and different cultures we're brought up with. Mm -hmm. So it's it's and so also to help those who are in those industries to transition from them to a plant based mm -hmm. industry or as oh, I won't say what one of the characters says in the film. I don't want to give a spoiler of his wonderful line, but not wonderful, but uh, his line. That he, he did actually write that line, I must say. Mm. Mark wing it at the end. So credit to Mark. Um, yeah, so change that we go plant-based ultimately, that we see each other all as equals, like the little ant, you know, and the bird, which is easier. The bigger the animal gets, the more respect we seem to give it. Right. And if it's en masse, we seem to give it less respect than if it's just a solo. We go, we can identify one on one, like, oh, you know, we can call it a name, but like on mass. So, yeah, every every creature, mm -hmm. human, non human, yeah. should be equal with then what more joy could we all have as, as humans or animal on this planet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be all equally deserving of the joy and happiness that we all wish for and safety. Mm -hmm. And you know what? And honestly, uh, the reality of that would be amazing, but just the thought of that brings so much comfort. Just the thought of that alone um, is inspiring. And so, yeah, well, and again, it's, it's, it's films like yours that I think are, provide that visual that we need um, and that help connect the dots that we are not, it's not an us versus them or, you know, they serve us. It's a, we're all in this together. And um, yeah, your film does such a beautiful job at illustrating that. Um, well, thank you. And, and of course, a film is not a solo thing. It's a, it's a village. It's a whole community of mm -hmm. actors and creatives and, and all kinds of people that have shared this journey with me have, have brought it to be the way it is. Otherwise, it would be different, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. one, one element were different. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful thing to have been in this kind of community and and people went vegan during went plant-based during the making of it the wow. guy mark wingett who plays the slaughter man he became vegan during the the, the filming and i i chose him <laughs> one of the reasons i asked him to do it because he's a great friend i thought i'm sure mark eats meat and he's just the kind of energy i want for that character yet he's also a really lovely guy and a beautiful talented guy and I thought what a great guy to have around and then when he went vegan I went Mark <laughs> <laughs> great though and and another young lady Holly Smith went vegan during watching it and um, during making it so she played one of the pigs so we've had a few people turn vegan during it and I'm vegan and the DOP was vegan and the lighting guy was vegan and uh, one of our producers was vegan and another one I think went went back to really being vegan during mm -hmm. during this so it's been a nice um, knock-on effect wow that is and that's an incredible incredible example then and um, <laughs> of concept right that the awareness right. can be converted into action and what you see and what you hear can change the course of everything and um, I love with your film, the fact that, you know, we know about change for it to be sustainable. It can't be an outside coming in. It has to be an inside coming out, right? And so people have to want the change here. It can't be, don't do this. This is bad, stop. It has to be, I want to stop 
this is bad. I don't like this. I don't want this. And it has to start here in your film, Plants That Seed. It gives people that opportunity to, to make that choice, you know, as opposed to being told what to do, right. you're being asked um, to do what you know that you should. Well, that's, that's so beautiful that you, that you say that about the film. I mean, exactly. If, if you're told to stop doing something that you're doing anyway, out of habit, mm -hmm. that's really hard. But once you get the information, perhaps delivered in a way that's palatable, yeah. you know, sugaring the pill in a, in a way, as we used to say mm -hmm. in the olden days, uh, you know, sugaring the medicine a little bit making it able to be received without laying blame, without pointing fingers, because we're all in this together and we all, we're all learning every day. It's a journey, it's a journey. So one moment of going, oh, I see, that happens, does it? Is a seed planted, isn't it? And then it will grow or not, hopefully it will. But once you're given the information, and you learn of it or you find out, yeah. then it's a slow burn of, or a fast burn. Some people quick, some people slow, but, but as we both know, and probably anyone else who's been there watching it, it's not an easy mm -hmm. transition because it involves pain in some way of realizing that that is what happens or, and it affects, well, maybe we have been a part of that system. Mm -hmm. and that's guilt that we carry and but at least we don't have to keep carrying it right exactly we can set it down we can let it go and um you know I, you, I, yeah. I love how you're talking about that like how it's delivered and how it's you know translated in essence and it, it made me think for a moment about um so jack and i we have six kids and um you know i think about uh one of our younger ones who's um, going through a phase right now and um, you know so it's one thing to shout 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 stop 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 you know um, or it's one thing to say hey come here yeah. and it's the whisper that right. nine times out of ten is going to work so much more so the fact that your film whispers what other people are shouting those shouts sometimes can't be heard they fall in deaf ears but isn't it interesting that the whispers are generally much uh, easier to receive. <laughs> well, I don't, yeah, I mean, I a whisper is certainly lovely, but I, I think there's a place for it all. <laughs> you know, um, I, I love the fact that if you if you say this is a whisper, I love that. That, that sits well in my soul. Mm -hmm. um, we've all perhaps wanted to shout. And I think whatever anyone does, I think it's a, it's a, it's, um, it's a multi kind of pronged kind of, mm -hmm. you know, like well, the way you treat an illness may be different, like medicines, like holistic or, you know, from the chemist or, you know, from the drugstore, or what if you call it here and, and, you know, like prescribed or, you know, so all, and, or, or talk therapy, you know, you, whatever ailment you have, there'll be a different way of dealing with it. So holistically always, might be the way all together as long as there are all of them going on the shouting and the whispering and the intellectual approach or, or the guilt trip or the non guilt trip. i don't know who i i mean as long as it's not harmful to anyone else or mm. anything else mm -hmm. then yeah 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 no it's um, just incredible work, um, you know, and and speaking of this incredible work from actress to activists, these different facets of you after producing this film, do you see yourself producing more films to fuel change? Well, it's it's such a huge been a, such a huge journey that's kind of ebbed and then like flowed again that now it's in another flow of just pre-distribution mm -hmm. that it's I can't think beyond it um and you say actor to activist I'd like to I suppose call it actorvist yes <laughs> I love that <laughs> let's do that <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, um maybe in for mercy that's what I've been an actorvist <laughs> um um but I've written in the lockdown uh, uh 
a film or I'd like it maybe to be a series. I'd like to pitch somewhere called Swim. And it's about the craze of cold water swimming, but it's, it, it, it was because it was what I was doing, wild cold water swimming during lockdown, which is more of a community thing, which again kind of wrote me. I, I seem to have not a lot of say in these things. They come, I'm not like a writer by trade. Mm -hmm. so it's a harder job for me and uh, so it has to I have to wait until something really speaks mm -hmm. but I all I do have a short uh, called cow calf that I, I uh, recorded with a young lady called Ali Graves that I'd like to redo with um, a lady called Lydia Bradford perhaps that is about a cow and a calf and and it's about 20 minutes perhaps and that would be the about the the journey of a cow and a calf in the dairy industry because that is a whole other a whole other set mm -hmm. of circumstances so there's that in in the in the chest waiting to emerge but it's written um so we just have to get it on to but we haven't we were going to do it during lockdown actually but then lockdown and it was harder to mm -hmm. get that all together yeah. so maybe once mercy's I've done this little bit of journey this next couple of months while it's in the American film market to see that through to November the 24th and we know where it's going to land yeah. then I'll be open for the next birth <laughs> <laughs> the, your, your next chapter as an actorvist yes <laughs> or, or a directorvist we should say I suppose right yes yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait for the universe to kind of coincide with my desires at the time and see if we can marry something that might be useful. Mm -hmm. so I don't want to just do something. I mean, it'd be great to do something just starring me and, you know, like, but uh, I didn't work out that way. So I don't know. That probably won't happen. <laughs> it would be pretty, pretty dull. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> So, so about this film, I have had the honor and the great privilege to watch, to experience it, I will say, um, not just watch it, to experience it. Um, but so how can other people then see, share your film? You say uh, it's, it's, in its on its way into distribution or? Yeah, well, I'm hopefully speaking to a distributor or perhaps more. Uh, certainly there's one uh, that's been in, con in connection and uh, during my time in LA, the next couple of weeks it's currently uh, screening in the American film market I don't know how anyone can access that particularly if it's a it's a, you've got to be in a certain kind of union or I don't know whatever field to access that like to be a, a, a seller a buyer rather uh -huh. a distributor or who's someone who's already got a film in there and or a critic so those are the people that can currently view but it finishes uh with the american film market on the 24th of november okay and no it doesn't what am i talking about the 24th of december ah okay not november 24th of december uh it finishes in the Amer american film market so hopefully it will go out online on online platforms shortly after that is the is the aim and um I'm sure we'll be letting people know all over the place. So mm. there's a, there's Mercy um, Facebook, Mercy Instagram, and a, w a website, mercyfilm.info. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that people can check out where that's going to be. We'll put Mercy Film in Instagram uh, or YouTube or Facebook. Right. Okay. So we'll just um, follow along sure and and just wait for the news. And, yeah. Uh, so hopefully by the twenty fifth of December we should twenty. Yeah, by Christmas Day, it may be a present to the world. Not a very uh, easy present, but. Right. Well, and a great way to begin a new year with a new lens to look through and a new way yeah. to see and to be. Uh, so, what an incredible, incredible film you've you've shared and uh thank you so much wendy for helping all of us become a bit more aware now thank well th thank you so much for all your beautiful words and your compliments and i'm i'm just joining into an already very vibrant conversation i've met some incredible people that are doing incredible work such as yourself 
all over the world, you know, via the wonderful internet that we have. Mm -hmm. that I, and I'm just joining in in my little small indie film to the conversation. So thank you for having me in that conversation. And thank you for sharing. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you, Ali. <laughs>